Good morning. Almost afternoon. Uh, so we were going to talk to you guys all about uh, OpenStack with Intel IT, but, but Guillaume from Digital Film Tree inspired us. We're just going to talk about sweaters as a service. Um, it's a it's a new new technology, and uh, I got you know some of my cohorts, uh, Greg Bunce and Sridhar. So uh, I hope you guys are okay with that. It wasn't what we submitted as abstract when we got accepted, but it's good to be on the leading edge. Um, so. Uh, you know, we've been uh, OpenStack users uh, for quite some time. Also, Intel is obviously a major OpenStack contributor. Uh, and what we're going to do is just basically walk you through the, the life of uh, three years. Uh, Greg and, and Sridhar are also going to do a talk, uh, I think, tomorrow at, at 520 to go into even more depth about the specifics. Of course, those slides will be available, video too. But, you know, are you guys going to serve beer at 5? Okay, so we'll, we'll try to get some beer in their session. Um, we'll see how we do. Okay, so let's just jump right in. And we're gonna try to leave five minutes for Q&A, but, uh, but we're also easy to find. Um, you can find me at DOS at Intel, um, and I can connect you with, with Greg or Sridhar too, uh, as well as we'll, we'll be available for uh, chatting. Uh, so just a real quick view. About 100,000 uh, Intel employees, of course, we're across the world. Uh, if you don't know, we, we predominantly build silicon. That's uh, the brains of you know, most of the data centers and, and still a pretty substantial uh, a client base out there. Uh, we have lots of data centers across the world. Um, we've been focusing heavily on, on how to drive that data center capacity uh, to be you know, highly optimized. So, so cloud is one of those technologies. Uh, all three of us have experience in, in our design grid environment as well as, uh, as what we do in traditional IT. The talk today is gonna be mostly on traditional IT. Um, so just to give you a kind of perspective, internally, we look at this thing called domes, is, is what we coin it inside, but we, we basically segment our different types of environments based on what we're doing. So very similar to how a, a business would look across their vertical segments. So uh, design is the majority of our environment. Uh, Greg and I both grew up in the design space supporting our, our grid environments, about 60,000 servers uh, that basically handle chip uh, silicon simulations. Uh, we have manufacturing, of course, so we put, we put a, a large data center basically next to every factory that's building uh, silicon or doing assembly a test. And then what we're going to focus on today is, is office, enterprise, and services. We, OpenStack actually will affect all these areas, but we're doing it at a different pace uh, for the different use cases. So I'll, I'll describe that in a bit. Um, and just real quickly, so uh, we called cloud, um, well, sorry, grid, the, the uncle of cloud, um, because grid has a, most of all the attributes that you would think of from a cloud, self-service, resource pooling, multi-tenancy, uh, elasticity. But if you, we, we focused heavily on, on a design computing grid a number of years ago, uh, where we made the switch from Unix to Linux, um, and we drove massive uh, optimization in the environment that, that saved us you know, quite a bit of, of cash. And we took a lot of those concepts and applied those to the private cloud environment. And then this cool thing called OpenStack came out, which to us, you know, Linux was for the hosts and, uh, and OpenStack's for the data center. So it brought an ability for us to continue to optimize, and that's what we're going to focus on. So uh, we do run our IT shop as a business. Uh, you guys want to, what do you want to talk about to our, our big three goals in here? Basically, we're, uh, we're looking uh, at, at velocity vectors, get from you know, uh, 120 days to land a physical server through the virtualization phase. We got it down to under 20, and now it's, it's under an hour to land individual instances. So with uh, platform as a service on top, we would be driving toward idea to production in, in basically one day. So the, these types of velocity improvements for our end users, um, always on compute, right? So our customers never feel or see any downtime at all. And then sustain our operations while dealing with a, a flat to down budget. Uh, it increased the ratio of servers to engineers that support them. Yeah, we've used these, these three vectors for, for years now. Uh, and they work well at our, our CIO staff level and also for our technical teams to say, hey, how do I keep pushing the envelope in what we're doing? Um, just, just a real quick, you know, most of you probably have some ugly server landing processes. This is way back in time, wow, a long time ago, yeah. Q4 2010. Uh, but this is, this is what the day in the life of acquiring a server was and I'm surprised to find that still some 
uh, enterprise IT shops still have the, these crazy processes. There's lots of people in all these steps. Uh, but so we, in 2009, it was uh, 90 days of physical, as Greg said, 24 days for virtual. Uh, in 2010, we did our first private cloud. And a distinction that we have between a lot of enterprise IT shops is, is we believe in self-service for everyone for dev test, non-prod, and production. So, so fundamentally give the ability for the app guys to make things happen. So it was three hours virtual, but two, two weeks, weeks for networks. Um, and then in 2000, 2013, where, we, where we're running now, you know, under 30 minutes for a compute in many, most scenarios, and storage and network now, now on demand. So, and as Greg said, you know, where we're going next is, is idea to production in less than a day. Because everything is about uh, enabling our app developers to try things really quick, fail fast, and they have to have those capabilities. So not only do we drive OpenStack usage internally, uh, also at the platform to the service level with, with Cloud Foundry today. Um, so a little bit on, on cost. Uh, so we, we believe in uh, this concept of owning the base, rent the spike. Uh, we've done lots of math calculations. Being a fairly large enterprise shop uh, and being willing to take a lot of uh, cutting edge risks in order to push down the, the cost envelope while increasing our feature parity with the public cloud, uh, we found that this model works really, really well for us. Uh, and so it doesn't mean that we, we buy more capacity than we need because we, we use the ability to rent the spike. And, and just quickly on our strategic direction, based off the, the cost vector, the agility, um, the reason that we're doing this is uh, we have uh, apps anywhere, anytime, for any device, uh, for our, our internal end users. So they should be able to access the stuff, which means the software developers have to be able to uh, build the solutions really, really quickly. Um, for a cost vector, uh, it's driving a large-scale automated hybrid cloud infrastructure, and we're also very, very interested in helping our peers in other enterprise IT shops by you know, showing them, hey, this is what we did, um, and also we use it to, to help us you know, figure out the tough challenges. What we love about OpenStack is it uh, created a, a community. So we can actually now talk with our peers openly versus talking about our proprietary code, or maybe uh, we can't talk about NDA discussion uh, that we got from, from a, a vendor. Okay, so uh, you're the next one, right? The history and path to open cloud. So I talked about the design grid since the 1990s, uh, 60,000 servers, we call this cloud's uncle. We did an enterprise private cloud in 2010. This is run about 13,000 VMs across 10 data centers. Really just compute infrastructure as a service. But uh, everything is virtualized in this environment. Almost everything's uh, on demand. And then we decided to open source private cloud. And I'll, I'll walk through these uh, in a little more detail. Um, so our, our goal is this federated, interoperable, and open approach. So federated, since we own the base, rent the spike, and this is, uh, we also use software as a service solutions, we need uh, identities to be federated across all these, these different environments. So from end user's perspective, it's really easy with your software developer or an app user to be able to, to connect to these different services seamlessly. Uh, we strongly believe in interoperability. Uh, the standards bodies haven't caught up to the, the massive pace that we're making in, in open source today, so the natural uh, choice it appears to be interoperability through open source. And uh, again, open. So it doesn't have to be open source necessarily. Open standards are good for us too, but we do want uh, uh, open APIs that allow us to run public and private. Hoping uh, you guys can see some of this wording back there. Um, but um, this is a, a, a journey that we've, we used internally for our CIO staff, and then uh, the Open Data Center Alliance uh, grabbed it and is using it to describe uh, the path to this goal, this federated, interoperable, and open cloud. Uh, we used to, uh, you know, you, you don't have to use the years, you can just say versions. Some people move at a different pace. But I'm just going to walk you through how we went uh, down this path. Um, for our consumers, uh, we have IT ops, so that's where we drove a lot of automation. Uh, the app owner who was, and the app developer, the key distinction there, app owner buys an app, installs it on server, app developer writes code. Um, and then our goal of, of how we enable the end user to be you know, able to access you know, any data, any apps, anytime, anywhere, any device. So all of our work has been focused on how to uh, both drive those, those value vectors that we talked about and to make sure our consumers, which are Intel employees, uh, can get what they need. So uh, pre-OpenStack, we ran this private cloud gen one. Uh, all three of us have lots of scars and, and fun times of, of when we just something simple as provide self-service to app teams. 
how many times did we uh, have uh, disagreements and, and arguments with, uh, with some of our folks about just turning on self-service. Right, pretty much daily. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it was, it was a daily thing. So uh, I, I remember uh, we, it was like 90 days, and we said, hey, uh, we want it under three hours. Everybody said, you're insane. Do it three, uh, three days. But we, we really just had to push through uh, the concept and get it out that you know, self-service should be the norm. It is the norm in the world. If, if you don't do it as an IT shop, why would the app developers not go and ignore you and go do something completely different? So we connected all of our available infrastructure. So we didn't just do Greenfield. Uh, we built a proprietary uh, software stack in-house in that allowed us to expose basically our compute environment, virtual machines, um, on demand. So uh, we saved quite a bit in this model because everybody chose to use that versus buying their own servers. So you know, a lot of this story you know, has been heard before and other are doing the same, but massive savings on resource pooling. Um, but what we found as we started working with these cloud aware app guys is that they needed more. Uh, acquiring a virtual machine is, is definitely not enough. And when we really thought heavily about how do we do full private infrastructure as a service, which is you know, give me compute, storage, and network on demand, as well as higher level uh, services like load balancer and firewalls, just way too much technical debt uh, to create the full solution. So, we went out, we investigated all open and proprietary solutions in 2011. It feels like that was ages ago. Uh, so we did a lot of analysis, and, and at this point in time, I think, you know, someone could correct me if I'm wrong, uh, when we made this call, I think there was like 80 developers on OpenStack, but what we, what we found in it was uh, the signs of, of early Linux and, and a true community approach. Uh, we were very, very early Linux adopters, too, and, and helped drive a lot of that uh, mainstream. But uh, so we, we made a decision that we're going to bet on OpenStack. Um, we had a very small team, probably 10 people. We convinced our CIO in a, in a closed room that you know, this is the way we got to go. We, we built a small DevOps team to just basically go fast. And by June 2012, we're online for production Cloudware apps. This was Diablo by the time we actually got an environment with, with Essex Keystone, right? Right. So we, we started with Cactus in the lab. So, but we needed a public cloud solution. Uh, we, we didn't have enough. Uh, capacity in this space to, to be able to handle all the demand that we're getting. And uh, the legacy apps need love too. So you, you see the pets and cattle concept a lot at the OpenStack summits, but uh, uh, you know you can think of it, the legacy apps are built uh, not for design for failure, uh, and they're going to be around for a while. Even with the projections that say by 2018, something like 70% of the environment will be these new apps, we still have quite a bit of environment that's not. So uh, what we did is, uh, and where we're at right now, we're going to dig into is, is we have live migration enabled. Uh, we're, we're moving forward with a single control plane, and, and the guys will talk about this. And we have two POCs going. Actually, we just completed one uh, where we're doing hybrid OpenStack in, in a public-private environment. So from an end-user perspective, they can go to Horizon or the API, and, and we can make basically treat a public cloud environment as a, as a region. Um, so we're very close right now to our five-year goal. Want to take over on the sure. choices? Okay. In terms of uh, our private cloud, um, I'll share some of our design choices that we've made as well as uh, some of uh, the architectural um, choices that we have made and share some of the architectures that we have. Um, in terms of uh, when we started off building our um, private cloud environment, the, one of the main goals for us is to be able to abstract the underlying infrastructure from, uh, as well as the cloud providers from the user. And that's, uh, that's why uh, where uh, OpenStack was a very um, um, useful for us in terms of uh, achieving our end to abstract the uh, underlying infrastructure. And um, another key aspect is you have multiple cloud instances at different uh, regions not on the public side as well as the private side to have a common identity store and be able to federate across um, instances that you're provisioning across those. And another conscious choice that we made was um, open source first, um, primarily because uh, we wanted to minimize uh, any proprietary API lock-in and to give us the choice um, in terms of uh, having different solutions in the back end, but uh, have a common con control plane that abstracts uh, the user automation and, the, uh, and basically the uh, orchestration automation thereof. Okay. Um, and uh, as Das indicated, our goal is to support both 
Cloudware apps as well as legacy apps because uh, legacy apps are still around in our environment and they'll be uh, around for a while. Hey, just one, one quick key point on, on back there. So uh, when we abstract the, the cloud providers, what we, what we also need to be able to do is expose key hardware features. So I don't know how much you guys know right now what's going on. Uh, even uh, at Amazon, uh, they're now making it really easy for you to find an instruction set. So most uh, software developers and, and probably Sorry if I, I knock anybody here. But most software developers initially, when they start doing complex solutions, uh, they're not too concerned about performance and some key vectors that you can gain from instruction sets. When you start really, really optimizing your software and getting it you know, optimized for, for speed and cost, you have to start using more sophisticated uh, solutions underneath the hood. So for instance, Amazon today exposes uh, uh, key instruction sets for, for encryption, um, as well as uh, for, for massive graphics analysis. So these types of things we have to be able to expose out out at the same time that we, for the software developers, they have that one API that allows them to work across all environments. Um, in terms of at a high level technical strategy, uh, where we started off um, in, in 2010, uh, when we uh, went on our uh, OpenStack journey, is um, in fact our, our private cloud uh, uh, journey, uh, our first goal was to leverage as much of our own infrastructure as possible because we had a significant amount of internal um, uh, internal infrastructure and pretty much uh, of a cloud provider size, if you will. And uh, there's, so there was a conscious choice for us to uh, take the goal of use our capacity first before uh, going out um, and paying an external pro provider thereof. Um, and uh, where we have been using public cloud is for targeted purposes, for non-differentiated apps, and primarily um, in the software as service and more so in the infrastructure as service as we have gone on over the last couple of years. Um, where we want to be is uh, where we are evolving towards is essentially have the smart, uh, smart orchestration layer where we are able to make uh, policy-based decisions, whether it be cost-related, whether it be proximity to the end user, capacity-related, or, um, or basically uh, certain, based on certain security capabilities to be able to make the choices and move the workloads, whether it be on a public or a private cloud, and be able to create, uh, uh, um, move the applications irrespective uh, um, uh, basically, uh, in a trans way transparent to the end user. Okay. And, and while there are uh, you know, solutions on the market today that, that cover that orchestration layer, uh, we, we strongly believe that this is the, the next area that, that will be massively open sourced. And there are some open source solutions today, uh, but we don't feel they, they have the, the full community backing yet. So uh, part of our goal here is, is as we enable that, first it's OpenStack as, as the API layer, but some of the more sophisticated telemetry and scheduling that's required for provisioning across multiple environments isn't in OpenStack yet. There's some people that are solving that across multiple clouds, um, but uh, we think this is an area ripe for, for massive open source uh, uh, sophistication soon. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, why Intel IT picked uh, OpenStack as our infrastructure as, uh, as a service control plane, we've touched on a lot of these items, but uh, just quickly going through this. Um, uh, it allows us to, the APIs provided by OpenStack allows us to expose the, um, the underlying hardware infrastructure in a self-service manner, not just uh, the compute aspects which we had done some custom automation on, but storage as well as network aspects of it. So that, by exposing the infrastructure, it allows us to build higher level of automation on top of that, which increases our velocity in terms of delivering solutions uh, um, to our customers, as well as um, by leveraging open source solutions, it increases our efficiency, uh, primarily because we are able to uh, minimize the internal technical debt. If we had to build this um, on our own, it would take much longer than us to leverage the community and part participate in the community to actually advance that. Um, so in terms of uh, how we are shifting our strategy as we go into 2014, there is a significant amount of uh, um, uh, cloud environments and virtualization environment that we had that was based on proprietary hardware uh, uh, hypervisors and um, uh, our uh, Gen 1 cloud solutions, as Das had indicated. As we move on to OpenStack and OpenStack-enabled open source first type of cloud, uh, cloud environments, um, what we are doing is actually using OpenStack as a control plane, but be able to provision to both environments, both our Gen 1 and Gen 2 environments, so that 
we are able to minimize the amount of migration that we have to do, but at the same time, we see that um, uh, it gives us a choice in terms of uh, what providers we use for the various infrastructure pieces in the back end. Intel, in general, has uh, uh, we make another conscious choice, which is to dual source or multi-source our um, infrastructure providers. So this enables that strategy as well in terms of having a common control plane, but be able to provision to multiple infrastructures thereof. Yeah, we can't we can't underestimate the the value of this. So this is this is a huge deal. So like if you took away one thing from us, it's the fact that that OpenStack can actually be the control plane for uh, all the investment that you have today, and the ability to allow you to bring in new investment or, or try out new technologies, all while giving your end users the ability to to write once, run almost anywhere. And the fact that we're starting to stitch this across the private to the public environment uh, with OpenStack as the control plane, this is massive. So this is. Has really never happened in the industry before. And what hasn't happened is that all the, uh, the current uh, major players have basically decided to, to join forces with OpenStack and build plugins. Um, so it's, it's off, it opens up a massive opportunity for the ecosystem to be very, very disruptive. And it forces everybody that maybe wasn't moving fast enough before, it forces them to move very, very quickly to keep up with all these startups that are showing up that are, you know, we had, uh, what, Ink Tank was bought for 175 million last week from Red Hat, you know, and we use this today in our environment, but there's an opportunity to basically, you know, cause massive disruption. So really, the one thing I, I would say is this, the single control plane is, is, uh, is, is massive. And you guys are gonna deep dive on this too tomorrow? Yep. Absolutely, okay. we'll go okay. much deeper uh, in this in our talk tomorrow at 5 p.m. Okay, um, in terms of some of the things that still need work and uh, where uh, we see as key areas to close for the enterprise from an OpenStack community perspective, um, one is um, we already, I mean, some of these we have uh, put the challenge up in 2013, some of the, uh, the, uh, the things that we are, we're actually leveraging, for example, shared block storage for boot volumes. Um, we also have the live migration capability um, in place because that is one of the elements that is very key when you are supporting both legacy apps and cloud aware apps. Live Live migration is not as necessary for the cloud aware apps, but for the legacy apps, you definitely need the live migration capability because, uh, uh, because of the nature of the apps. Hey, just, just one, one thing on that. And actually, I want to ask, how many work in enterprise IT or IT at all? Almost. OK, cool. Um, so, so this pets versus cattle thing is, is interesting, and live migration too. So at, uh, at Amazon today, um, right, if, if they, they want to take the host down, all the instances go down, or you know, you're, you're basically, you, you have to build everything designed for failure. Um, but Google did something pretty interesting not too long ago. They didn't make a lot of press about it, uh, but they basically turned on live migration uh, with KVM in Google, Google Compute Engine. So the, the fact that you know, there's a recognition that we can, you don't have to go completely one direction, though we highly suggest everybody build scale out apps. There is the capability with the technology to solve things like live migration. You don't have to pretend that it's impossible. Uh, it's totally feasible, both with our, our existing infrastructure and what we're doing uh, today with, with like KVM and Ceph with, with shared block storage. So right. it's not, it doesn't have to be one way or the other, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Another thing um, which is really key for us, especially when we are uh, trying to support legacy apps on top of, uh, or traditional enterprise apps, if you will, on top of uh, cloud infrastructure, is the restart of instances uh, when a host fails. Uh, primarily because um, of the nature of the apps and they're not able to, uh, not designed for failure, if you will, like the cloud over apps. Uh, disaster recovery and uh, being able to um, um, Abstract the infrastructure and work with the APIs is another key aspect. Um, another thing, as we are moving our journey, as um, Das indicated, year four and year five, where the target we want to move towards is a federated um, hybrid cloud environment. So as we move towards that, to have the ability to use um, uh, basically identity abstraction, whether it be through federation or whatnot, to be able to work across the, uh, the different environments and keep the user experience consistent is, is absolutely key, key for us. And, uh, and that we see as a, a next uh, level of evolution from an OpenStack community perspective. Another thing uh, which has already been called out even in the keynote today um, in terms of rolling upgrades being a, a very key aspect of moving towards um, keeping, uh, making this an um, OpenStack-based environment um, uh, enterprise sustainable, if you will. So rolling upgrades, making it secure, 
adding more capabilities for us to be able to do audits against, um, the, the infrastructure be able to detect issues very quickly uh, is absolutely key as we move forward um, on our journey for, um, based on OpenStack. Okay. So this is uh, uh, some of the things that we had, uh, Das had shared at the Hong Kong summit in terms of uh, areas that, um, uh, areas of challenge that need to be addressed from a community perspective. We have hit some check marks in terms of things that we already be implemented in an environment like boot for volume and live migration, but there's still more work to be done in terms of the, um, the restart on failure and uh, some of the other things that we have just uh, touched on. Hey, at a, at a quick check, for, for all the IT people, or actually anybody, who would want restart on failure, a few of you. Um, yeah, so we this is a, this is a, a thorny topic, and, and we're trying to get um, the the PTLs to to help us tackle this. Where hopefully we'll we'll get some more time this week. Uh, but it's it's a tricky problem, especially because it requires OpenStack and all the components to be aware of different things that are going on. So the way it's handled in, in some environments today is just, just massive intelligence of, of what the host is doing, what the hypervisor is doing, and what the guests are doing. So we need that type of same intelligence uh, to basically automate the concept of restart on, on failure. Um, so we, we, we're going to talk about this later, but there's going to be enterprise birds of feather, and we're trying to get everybody that's involved in enterprise to meet up tomorrow. And uh, you know, we have our list. I bet you have your list. And we want to help basically, as, as users, uh, communicate back to the, the PTLs, you know, hey, this is, this is a really tough thing. Um, I, I would like to start on failure to be solved by Juno. Um, I don't know if that's possible, but uh, it's, uh, it's definitely a, a big ask. And you have some more asks too, right? Absolutely. So in terms of uh, storage, we definitely uh, are looking to leverage more and more uh, of the open, uh, open distributed block storage sol uh, solutions. As Das had indicated, we leverage Ceph in our environment, but I, uh, there's more th uh, to be done in that space to be able to harden uh, the block storage uh, uh, solution so that it is uh, ready for enterprise scale from that perspective. Um, as well as um, uh, some of the capabilities that uh, we are seeing com uh, coming, they've evolved quite a bit, but there is more room to, uh, to, to be able to scale to enterprise needs uh, from a block storage solu solution perspective. Um, another thing, um, we've, uh, from a networking perspective, we've seen the core capabilities be available um, via cell service, like the routing and switching elements, be able to do security groups, and uh, some of the basic access control. But as we go forward, uh, um, uh, the load balancer service and having it basically have more richer capabilities than where it is, as well as the firewall as a service, um, so that all pieces of the infrastructure are abstracted. So today, for the load balancer service, we actually leverage proprietary APIs that our hardware load balancer vendor provides and use that for our self-service. But as we go forward, what we would want to see from the community is expand those capabilities so that we don't have to use the proprietary APIs thereof. Okay. So in terms of 2014 and going forward focus areas, uh, some of these we've touched on. Rolling upgrades, absolutely critical, um, so that we can actually upgrade our cloud environment in, in a sustainable manner and very key for the enterprise um, IT needs. Be able to connect to all existing infrastructure from a single control plane. We talked about various elements. There are a lot of elements that we are already connecting via single control plane. But as we indicated, load balancer and firewall, as a, a, a couple of examples where we would also want to see uh, those e infrastructure elements also be able to uh, encompassed or uh, comprehended within a single control plane strategy. Restart of VMs, we talked about it uh, quite a bit. Um, hybrid cloud to create that abstraction layer between uh, private and um, public cloud instances. And um, expand OpenStack to take on more traditional work like backup and recovery. Uh, bare metal provisioning is another area where, from a virtualization perspective, the single control plane and the abstraction of the infrastructure works quite well. But as we move forward, um, we would want to be able to provision physical servers the same way so that uh, the whole uh, hosting environment, the whole data center environment can be managed from a single control plane. Okay. Greg, do you want yeah, to so we, we, we talk a ton about technology, uh, <laughs> but we actually probably should have put this first. Um, and, and we promised we'd talk about some of the, the, the tough challenges we had. Uh, and I, I'd say people uh, was, was definitely, it wasn't all technology, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, it turns out that uh, 
people and culture will be some of the biggest barriers. You know, we, we, we tend to come to conferences like this and talk about CICD or DevOps and they, they have some industry buzz to them, the, those, those words, but we, we need to recognize that there are additional dimensions that need to be acted upon inside the, uh, the, the people environment to affect these, these types of changes. Right, so we, we would be talking about workforce transformation in terms of driving from uh, you know, workforce with proprietary skills. They can go very deep on particular tools, but they're not very broad and pluggable in the sense that, that we can use them in a, a broad spectrum DevOps type of approach. So you can see on this foil, we've, we've driven from some very uh, centric type roles uh, on the hardware side and the tool side to a software-centric uh, workforce, right? So software engineering, large-scale uh, systems and uh, management would be the types of skills that, that we're after. Um, in, in addition to the workforce transformation, you know, maybe capturing a few unicorns, uh, there, there are the support model type considerations. So driving from a L1, L2, L3 kind of established support model to DevOps where applicable, right? There, there is a spectrum where, where it makes sense. But as we saw in our uh, grid computing environment, once, once you're able to get to that end of the spectrum, you don't need to go into your data center and deal with every single host that's down. You wait until 10% 10, 10 of your hosts are down, and that's when you deal with them in, in, in batch. So these, we'll, we'll talk more about these tomorrow, but there, there are additional factors that need to be taken into account. So uh, driving from proprietary tools to scripting fundamentals. Um, put, put your uh, developers on the front line Right, so have, have them taking tickets, give them the opportunity to deal with problems on a longer term basis, do some actual problem management instead of being on call and being barraged by uh, incidents, right? Uh, the key, key technologies would be broadly OpenStack, Linux, Python. You, you end up with some pretty, pretty pluggable people. We, we call them around Intel T-shaped resources, right? So, so pretty broad across the top and able to go deep uh, somewhere typically but uh, pre pretty pluggable overall. So drive uh, small teams of experts geared around feature teams, drive agile software development life cycles everywhere, and automate everything, get away from the pages of documentation, the, no the knowledge articles. This is again that front line type of a, uh, uh, put, put your dev people in the fire to automate the environment. Base, base. And we still do like ITIL, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we, we follow all the IT practices, but we, we basically had to go in and show uh, a lot of that you can automate. So when you, you do your problem management, rather than just writing a knowledge base article, just write, fix it right, yeah, with a script exactly. or, and, uh, and, and share that, that, that knowledge with, with your peers through the script. You know, less documentation that tells you how to point and click and, and more uh, documentation and code. Mm -hmm. change or become irrelevant. Yeah, we were thinking a lot of ways to show this as a picture, but that, that's probably good enough. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a slight disagreement, I think, in, in the, the industry, whether or not um, OpenStack, and it probably does, needs that really easy, easy button, um, so, so anybody can do it. Um, and, and sure, that, that needs to happen, but it's, it's really important, we believe, that uh, your, your IT workforce is, is skilled and is changing. Um, it's, it's very easy to become irrelevant now uh, with the capabilities that are coming out. So you, you have to go deep, you have to be that T-shaped model uh, and, and really you know, help them, help your team uh, become you know, software developers or you know, at least able to read the code um, and, and be able to get, give feedback in, but you know, change or become irrelevant. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, just, just to kind of wrap up, so our, our, our Intel IT Open Cloud, um, we, these are the three vectors I showed earlier, you know, velocity, agility, um, automation to drive, help us drive down the cost while, while scaling, uh, and efficiency, a lot of this, uh, that's on, on the resource pooling concepts. So we've been uh, pretty successful both with our Gen 1 environments as well as what we're doing with OpenStack 2. Uh, we did say we'd talk about some ugly stuff as well, so I don't know if we want to give any examples of, of really terrible situations that have happened over the last year with, with OpenStack. Can you guys think of any that you want to? Anything really ugly? It's tough because OpenStack mostly works. <laughs> I mean, uh, for block storage, I mean, but it's not really OpenStack, right? So, so we've had a. Um, 
when we had a failure of uh, uh, nodes, it basically caused some of the mem memory and uh, CPU to spike up, which caused uh, an, an impact from that perspective. So that is what we meant by hardening the block storage aspect. And, and that's, that's actually a good right. example. So right, for us, right. it was a learning, right. uh, where, where basically we, we had some failures, not enough distribution of, of nodes, too large of nodes uh, for, for handling this type of failure zone. But, uh, but what we learned out of that was, hey, you, we can slow down the recovery of the technology, uh, this one with Seth, and be able to, uh, right. to, to keep it up. Uh, we're still dealing with some, some performance issues, but Absolutely. nothing catastrophic. So uh, we were hoping to tell you guys a lot of ugly stuff, but um, OpenStack actually works pretty well. And uh, I think probably most of our stuff was just getting the, the culture change uh, out there and getting people to accept that you know, this, is, this is code and, and you can work against it. So uh, we want all IT shops involved. Um, there's uh, the, the analysts and, and the press, are, are, I think, are starting to pick up that that OpenStack is real. We kind of think it's a done deal. Uh, OpenStack is the, the cloud operating system for data center, just as Linux was for hosts. So you can join us on Wednesday. We're going to do a birds of feather. It's the kickoff. There's a special focus from the OpenStack Foundation to help drive uh, a very clear direction to make sure enterprises can utilize OpenStack. Um, Sridhar and Greg will be uh, talking about Intel IT uh, in more depth, so a lot more on the control plane, a lot more on our CI, CD processes. And, uh, and a way, if you're not writing code, is to help us with blueprints. So uh, what you'll find is if you go talk to some of the dev guys, they're, they're very, very nerdy, and they, they really want to maybe deep dive in, in the, the quality of the code or, or the concepts of the code. But we need people in IT that think solution scale and can help us make blueprints that, that make a lot of sense and, and help the developers, because not all the developers actually have a massive experience running a large-scale environment. So we need those of you that do uh, to get involved and help us uh, create these blueprints. So, just wrap up, you know, we're federated, interoperable, open, uh, strong success. We're going forward with a single control plane, key thing to take away, and uh, there's lots of changes required to run at scale, you know, culture, skills, processes, and technology. So uh, with that, uh, we'll, we have a few moments for questions. Four minutes. Oh, I gotta do one plug. Uh, who wants a MacBook Pro? A new one? <laughs> so over in our booth, it's a little teeny booth, but we have two clusters running. Uh, the fastest person to get OpenStack up and running and launching VMs uh, will get a MacBook Pro. Uh, there's also uh, prizes for some other competitors. So, you know, if you want to try it out, see how fast you can do. We're hoping there's some wizards out there. And we're, we're going to run these at every uh, summit, not just Intel, uh, lots of people in the community, to basically say, hey, here's a really tough thing. So everybody wants a really easy way to install OpenStack. So we just want to basically prove it. So, uh, so if you want to show your chops, you know, uh, go over there and, and you could win a, a high-end MacBook Pro. Question, Mr. Helion. Nice shirt. <laughs> yeah. uh, feel free to go for the short answer for this, especially given the timing. Sure. Uh, for doing spikes where you're sending them off to other vendors that are not necessarily OpenStack-based, uh, I'm assuming that it's not just simply press a button. I'm assuming that the customer who's an internal customer for you is going to need to recode a little bit and that there's going to be some work, but that it's still a compute instance, can be a compute instance, but it's probably not like auto-migrating or anything. It's more, oh, let's try and move these, let's shut these down, start them up over there, let's start resetting them. I mean, basically, right. how much pain is there? Uh, yeah, so so basically, there's we, we chose to not put any magic in there. We actually had an orchestration layer before that was internal debt. Uh, we've shut that down. Um, we, we believe the model is OpenStack interoperable. So today, if you want to run something that's not OpenStack, uh, you basically have to uh, run in both locations and be able to scale out. So you keep a small environment. There's no magic with cloud workload movement. You know, everybody thinks that's it's a nice buzzword, but it's uh, you, we actually have to have active active instances, and then we can scale out in the other one if you're somebody that needs to uh, you know burst and for the spike. legacy workloads uh, to OpenStack. Did you have some kind of criteria of what kind of workloads you want to migrate to OpenStack? Like yeah, so let's be really clear there. We're not migrating uh, the workloads. What we're doing is we're taking OpenStack and we're importing uh, all the VM metadata so OpenStack becomes the control plane. So everything that's already running today, and, and this is you know one of our, our key points we want to get across too, everything that runs today, we're not moving it. We're going to absorb it into OpenStack so OpenStack can control it. Right, so you can have all the basic functionality you can get out of OpenStack with everything that's already running today. 
Uh, did you need to have, uh, so you talked about live migrate. Did you uh, need to build some custom tooling on top of it to say, get higher SLAs on some of the workloads, uh, such as evacuate or something, if you have to get it working to get support higher SLA for you or some of those workloads? Um, so so uh, evacuate and restart on failure uh, doesn't exist very well in OpenStack today. So this is why we, we firmly believe in, we, we have live migration working in our, our existing giant private cloud environment. So again, we can keep that as it is with the restart on failure. Uh, we're, not, we're not throwing any other way and control with OpenStack. And what we want on, on the pure open source play environment is the ability to restart on failure, live migration. We can do live migration today uh, fairly well. It's not, not as fast as we would like, and it's not always perfect, but it, it does work. So you can do a host maintenance mode with Nova, and you can, it'll schedule out across the cluster if you have shared block storage behind it. Cool, I think we're, we're out of, oh wait, one last question, and then we'll, we'll wrap so, up. So, uh, you actually kind of touched on it, and you hey. kind of did already. Um, so I was uh, wondering about the uh, live migration piece. Um, you mentioned about it uh, not necessarily working well for uh, some workloads. The other thing I wanted to mention is I totally feel your pain on the set defaults. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hey, thanks everybody, and uh, have a good rest of the summit. <laughs>